Hello everybody. We are extremely tired and we just finished watching the Japanese uh, Grand Prix. And also I uh, watched World Superbike. So I have to say I feel so sorry for Toprak and all of this stuff, but we will not cover this today. This is a MotoGP episode today. And uh, we have plenty to talk about. Keelan, did you enjoy the races? How are you? Leo, hello and hello everybody and welcome back once again to the Bad Moto GP podcast. As Leo said, we are both dying inside and outside from watching the Japanese Grand Prix at Motegi. Um, first of all, big love to the Asian market and to the Asian motorcycle community because the crowds are amazing and the people are brilliant. I don't actually mind staying up to watch it because I love the Asian theater of races. I think they're really, really good. And this weekend was no different. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, you know, as we know as fans, Motegi is one of the most challenging circuits on the tr on the calendar. You know, you've got really hard braking points. You've got real smooth zones, some really fast acceleration on the back straight, and it all comes together to always give us a great race. And this weekend was no different. So I have to say, really enjoyed the races and looking forward to breaking down what's been going on. Yes. Did you stay up the entire night or did uh, you wake up early? Um, I, tr I, I woke up early. Um, I tried making it through most of the night, but I just couldn't. Um, it was, it was too much. Um, it was too much, Leo. But no, I was up early. I caught the end of Moto 3, beginning of Moto 2. Um, so that's kind of where I got into it. And then I was able to literally just about stay up enough for Moto GP, especially with the two red flags and stuff. Um, so yeah, just about made it through. Hi, but yeah. did you stay up for the whole thing? No, 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 no. <laughs> I mean, um, I had a very entertaining last couple of days. I bought myself a motorcycle. So, uh, yes. Um, you didn't but, mention this. Yeah, I just uh, bought it because, uh, as you know, and maybe some people know, I don't know, um, I'm studying my master's degree in Berlin uh, now this uh, semester, like in two weeks it's officially starting and next week is like the what what did you call it freshers week freshers week ladies and gentlemen yeah. um yeah. send dm leo with all the images of freshers week so he knows what's going on yeah so um because in berlin you don't want to have a car you mm. can't get anywhere and uh, did you hear about the people gluing themselves to the road uh to <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, I had heard about that actually. Yeah. Just slam so, in between. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I thought a motorcycle would be a great idea. I thought about uh, buying a, a Vespa, like a scooter, mm -hmm. but uh, it looks hella gay. <laughs> my girlfriend said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, because I'm quite tall. I'm one meter ninety four. So, so like six foot two, six foot three? Nah, it's more, it's a uh, thick six foot four or five or whatsoever. Yeah, I, don't know. Yeah, I suppose it is around that yeah. actually, yeah. And um, yeah, it, it looks just wrong. And, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> um, so I bought a Honda CRF 300L, it's an Enduro. Nice. And um, I'm trying to, or I'm planning to uh, modify it to build a supermoto. I want <laughs> uh, harder suspensions, I want uh, road tires, smaller wheels, like uh, 17 inch uh, wheels at the front and the back. Now I have 21 in the front and 18 in the back. And I have those Enduro wheels and I don't feel comfortable on them riding on the road because they're not street tires so you just don't it doesn't feel right you know and also the suspension is too uh too soft i weigh 105 kilos so let's say with all the gear and all it could be 110 i don't know mm -hmm. for example if i have a backpack on and it's just so soft because it's in enduro so yeah i um I want harder suspensions, I want road tires, and then some gimmicks here and there, like those hand guards uh, with the turning signals implemented. I uh, looked at those. Yeah, but um, because of this, I was uh, at home, and uh, now the motorcycle is still at home. I just arrived at my flat yesterday evening pretty late because the trains were, um, were cheaper late. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, therefore, I got home pretty late, and then got up pretty early to watch Moto3 and I have to be honest I fell asleep during Moto2 because the race was so fucking boring. That is true. And uh, then I 
I made a nap between Moto GP and Moto Two, or like between Moto Two and Moto GP, mm -hmm. but I didn't feel uh, like getting up. Then that's like the biggest mistake you can ever do. Like, yeah, I will take a thirty minute nap. Yes, you would. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I ended up sleeping until I believe ten a.m. or whatsoever, and then rewatched it. Mm -hmm. I have to be honest. I clicked pause on my Apple TV when the race was about to start and uh, then when i woke up again i tried to resume it and the video pass didn't resume on this place on, and um, skip towards the end so whoever is responsible for the moto gp website for the moto gp video pass it looks like an intern did it because it's so incredibly bad i don't know who did it the new website is just embarrassing for like the biggest motorsport or the biggest motorcycle sport uh, in the world and i mean get some people in there who know what they're doing and make this experience a little bit better because the video pass and the whole moto gp website i don't like it at all it's so unprofessional they tried to um They tried to upgrade it uh, recently, but then just uploaded the beta version. And I don't know what the fuck's going on there. It's like the marketing, you know, probably two uh, interns run this whole ship. And Dorna's just uh, not willing to spend any money there. But uh, yeah, back to the races. I watched uh, MotoGP then when I woke up. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it was a very, very wide race. Yeah. The outcome wasn't too surprising. I mean, if uh, we talked before the race, I would say, yeah, Jorge Martin could win. Or like the podium mark was a little bit of a surprise. I thought Bezeki would be better. But like more or less Peko and uh, Jorge at the front in which position uh, was more or less expected. Mm -hmm. But um, still, it was very, very entertaining. And I thought... First of all, let's talk about Jorge Martin and Peko and the championship because this thing is tight now and Jorge Martin is like on his wave and it looks like Peko isn't too confident at the moment to battle with him. But then on the other hand, I think Peko has still more to lose than Jorge Martin. And um, I think that he was careful and didn't uh, engage in any battling with Jorge Martin because he thought I have time and mm -hmm. then the red flag came. But then he also didn't want to crash again because like the, I think still the pressure is more on him because Jorge Martin, yes, he's now very close in the, champ in the championship, but from the feeling he's still more of the underdog, you know? Yeah. So, um, but incredible at the moment. And I remember us talking about it uh, when... Peko had this horrific high side that this is Jorge Martin's time to put the pressure on Peko and eat into this um, championship lead. Peko did him a huge favor with his crash in India because he's so fucking stupid. But, uh, I mean, Jorge Martin is just doing everything right at the moment. It's incredible what he's doing. And I still don't think he will win the championship. I think at the end Peko will prevail. But it's a very, very entertaining championship at the moment. Yeah, I just, um, before I get into the whole championship thing, I got to make a point about the MotoGP website and the past because you made a really good point. It looks like some shit from MySpace in 2008. <laughs> Jesus Christ, people, get it sorted because it is not a good look for our championship. Get the website redesigned in the off season. I'm glad you mentioned that. So, on to the championship race a la Jorge Martin and Peko Banyaya. Ladies and gentlemen, you may well start playing the Jaws theme music because Jorge Martin is coming for Peko Banyaya. And like you said, after the Indian Grand Prix, we made the point that this is the time for Jorge Martin to start piling the pressure on Peko. And he's doing that. He is doing everything he can. Um... You know, brilliant sprint race yesterday. Martin dominated as Jorge Martin does in the sprint race. And then for the main race, which was this morning or technically this afternoon, if you were in Japan, um, this morning, very, very wet race. We race got red flagged immediately. Obviously, went on to wet tires. Race got red flagged again. And then obviously, because the race was more than 50% done, race was cold, which was kind of the right decision. To be fair, the rain wasn't getting any better. And Jorge Martinez, yet another win. Um, and the pressure is really starting to come in hard on Paco Banyaya. Now, 
The reason I'm happy about this is because not only it makes the championship more interesting, but there's two different narratives that are coming out of this, and I really want to see which one prevails. The first one is, is that last year, me and you had a disagreement, and pretty much every member of the MotoGP community had a disagreement about the fa- the second factory seat of Ducati alongside Paco Bagnaia, and who should have gotten the second seat. And I think with Jorge Martin, he's held that grudge ever since last year, and this is his chance to prove a lot of people right and a lot of people wrong, and vindicate himself to a degree. Um... And I think if he is somehow able to win this championship, it would be such an unbelievable achievement for him because he's been the best rider in the grid this year, in my opinion. Anyway, I think he's been the most dominant. And I think if he is able to go all the way and do this, it would be such an amazing achievement for him. And it would be an amazing achievement for Pramac as well. But here's where the second narrative comes in. If Paco Bagnaia is able to deal with this pressure and show what he's made of as a champion and he's able to retain his title, then that's an equally brilliant storyline because a lot of people are not sure if Paco is going to crack or not because this is the most serious pressure he's been under in a couple of years. And I'm interested to see how he deals with this because Jorge Martin is not going to go away. He is going to push this all the way to Valencia. And if Paco can deal with this and come out the other side as the champion... You've got a brilliant narrative there, and Paco will have proven a lot of people wrong as well. So, brilliant, brilliant title race we have in our hands. There is one singular solitary point in it. Who's going to be the winner at Valencia? Only time will tell. The thing is, Jorge Martin is so much more consistent than Paco. He's Mm. equally as fast, but much more consistent. He has two DNFs in the main races, both... uh, are the result of an ambitious uh no f- fuck i re- i uh, forgot something yeah the first one was mark marcus dive bombing into uh miguel Oliveira and Jorge martin in terms of now but i uh, made a mistake because i thought uh, alex marcus took Jorge martin out in uh, america but it was uh, vice versa mm. Jorge martin took uh, alex marcus out so this was like the only uh fuck up he had this season and Pekka had too many mm-hmm. and he has been consistent I mean when you take out America he's always been in the top five in uh, Great Britain and in Austria he had a bit of a bad stretch and like when Pekko is finishing he's either finishing first or second he is very very good but um, I mean the thing with Paco is he's just too inconsistent. If he just would finish races, he would have been gone with the championship already. Like at the moment, he's still, when he's finishing, better. But the overall package includes finishing a race. And Paco is just not consistent enough to maybe he gets away with it this year. But talking about Mark Marcus on a Ducati, because Mark Marcus will punish you for this. It's not like Jorge Martin is on the same level as Mark, you know? But um, different story. Paco is very, very good this season, but still too inconsistent. He uh, last year made the incredible achievement of um, of making up a 91-point deficit to Fabio Quattararo. Mm-hmm. This year, I believe he's on a track to blow like a 66, if I remember correctly. At one point, it was like 60 whatsoever to mm-hmm. Jorge Martin. And it's just crazy with this man. But um, still, both people uh, are very good riders. Peck just crashes too much. And I think Jorge Martin is having a really, really good, really consistent season and is developing very, very well. And, you know, you could make the argument that uh, Ducati made the wrong decision with taking Inia Bastinini. But on the other hand, what if Inia Bastinini never was injured? You know, there's this big what if so i don't know if we can fully answer this question i mean it could have been that uh Inia Bastinini completely uh ran over the whole model gp great if he was healthy you know but um at the end of the day we don't know it's like uh, what if we don't need to discuss but both are very very good but peckles just too inconsistent and i think Jorge martin would really deserve this because he's always been there except America. And like Portimao wasn't his fault. Shit happens. It's racing. But at the end of the day, he is doing a very, very good job. 
Yeah, completely agree. And this this is the killer for Paco Banyaya, the inconsistency. And this has been the buzzword we've been mentioning all season. You know, when Paco Banyaya is on top form, he is nearly untouchable, but he's not untouchable anywhere near enough as he should be. And that's the problem with his inconsistency. He just doesn't finish enough races. And, you know, at the end of the day, that's his biggest Achilles heel. Whereas with Jorge Martin, like you said, he has two DNFs this year in the main race. And one of them wasn't even his fault to begin with. You take out the one that isn't his fault. And he may have like a 20 point gap. You, you know, you don't know. But like I said, both riders are absolutely brilliant. It's great for the championship that we have this battle. And I'm looking forward to seeing who takes it at the end of the year i really am um i think i don't i don't think anything's going to be decided until the final day in valencia and i think it's going to make for one of the best finales in moto gp we've had in recent years and that will be great for everybody yes hopefully we won't have team orders like i mean Ugh. ducati probably wants the championship rider to win the title but then at the end of the day uh, the factory rider to win the uh, title and also it would be better to build Paco Bagnaia as a brand. But then on the other side, um, Ducati should get, uh, keep themselves out of this championship battle and provide yeah. both riders with the best. Because at the end of the day, it's either Ducati or Ducati. And if both fuck up, it's still a Ducati with uh, Marco Bezzecchi. So, I mean, Ducati has nothing to lose here and I hope they won't uh, interfere with the championship battle. And also, um, I hope no third person will get involved like in 2015 and we finally can get like a good finale in Valencia where hopefully both are equal on point and it just comes down to who wins Valencia. And um, I think Jorge Martin has just an incredible pace. I mean, the sprint races are more or less made for him. Yeah. Not that Paco is bad in the sprint races, but Jorge Martin, if he gets in front, he has this Jorge Lorenzo type style yeah. that he just has a pace that murders people. And Paco has the same thing. So um, a race like, imagine like a finale in, in a race like Saxon Ring, you know? <laughs> that, that would have been so awesome. Oh, yeah. Um, or that would be so awesome. But um, yeah, I think Jorge Martin's pace is just incredible. And I don't know if Paco is fully recovered from his high side in Catalonia, you know? Is he at 100% or is he just at 99%? Who knows? And um, also the upcoming tracks are so challenging because nobody is consistently there. You just go there for once a year. It's not like a Jerez where everybody races, tests and whatsoever or like a, um, like a Mugello. You just know those tracks. But those tracks on the... Um, on the other side of the world, nobody has been there for two years and now they have the experience from last year. It will be very, very interesting uh, to see where this one goes. And with Jorge Martin and his pace at the moment, it could very, very well be that he wins the championship because he's on his confident wave right now and nobody can stop him. Yeah, absolutely. And <clears throat> like that that's the reason I love these Far East races because they're the great equalizer in the premier class, you know. If it was a Hareth or a Magello or a Mizano or p basically take your pick of the European circuits, we all know guys like Banyaya and Martin and yada yada yada, they're all great on those tracks. Everybody's good on those tracks. But when it comes to Motegi, when it comes to India, when it comes to Mandalika, when it comes to Sepang, there are, there are factors outside of the rider's control that equalize the race for everybody. And that makes for a much better championship because it, it determines who can adapt, who can adjust, who wants it more than the others. And that's why I was so happy with the Indian Grand Prix a week or two ago as well, because it's the great equalizer. It basically creates a level playing field for everybody. And I don't want a MotoGP where, it's, where every race is like Hareth, where we know who's going to be the best and we know who's going to be the second best i want these tracks where it shakes up the season and it's the rider that makes the difference and not the bike and not the data and this and that and the other so i have to say we we are experiencing a great championship race right now and we're seeing a rider leading the championship who is making the difference not just the bike and i think that's a valid point worth mentioning for jorge martin 
Yeah. And uh, I have to disagree with you in one point because Malaysia, they have all the data there because they just test there yeah. all the time in the winter. But except that, it's very interesting and I'm very excited for all the overseas races. But coming back to Motegi, I think it was a little bit... I mean, I understand and I agree with the decision to red flag the race because it was just too dangerous and you don't want to have people hurting themselves. So from mm. a safety perspective, it's cool. On the other hand, it's a little bit, um, it leaves like a bit of taste in your mouth that you know, okay, Paco probably didn't attack because he thought he would have 12 laps to go or 11 laps to go. I don't remember. And um Oh, Martin maybe managed his pace a little bit different, but uh, I'm very impressed by both because Peko last year crashed in Motegi and Jorge is providing good races in the dry, in the wet, on new tracks, on tracks he knows he's just good at the moment. And I love it that it's the same bike, you know. You can't have the argument at the moment, yeah, uh, Fabio is on Yamaha, he is much slower, he has no chance. But it's the same bike, they, have, they use different aero packages, the ones they prefer. So I think it's it's incredible that we have this championship fight and I hope nobody interferes with it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's another very good point to mention as well as, as it pertains to Ducati. You know, I do not want there to be team orders here because I do not want a deserving rider potentially getting left out of a championship that could rightfully be his. You know, I, I like the leadership of Ducati, you know, um, Paolo Ciabatti, Jelinia, um, and all those guys. And I think if it comes down to the final day and it's not decided mathematically, I think they'll let them fight it out. And I hope they'll let them fight it out because it's good for the sport and it's better for the sport as well. You know, it's a reason I hate F1. I don't like team orders. If you're the best, you win. If you're not the best, you don't. That's that's it at the end of the day. So when it comes down to Valencia, if it isn't decided, let them fight it out because they've earned the right to fight it out as well. You know, Paco doesn't want a championship given to him. He wants it because he wants to be the best that wins it. And I know Jorge Martin doesn't want to give it to Paco because he's fought so hard to get to that stage. So Ducati, let them fight it out if it gets to that point. But there's still a lot of season left, you know, and we'll have to see what happens. But yeah, glad you mentioned that because that's something we don't want to see. The thing with team orders is I don't believe there's any person in the world right now who can tell Jorge Martin don't overtake Paco. Don't oh, go he's going to do it. He's, he's going gonna to do, do it. it. I'm worried about the other ones. What if Ducati says to Marco Bezzecchi, hey, don't overtake Paco or take it easy, easy with Paco or like a Juan Zarco or like if those things get involved, then it's going to be uh, not as good as a champion like a raw championship battle between two riders who are just the best at the moment and i really hope ducati doesn't interfere with it at all that marco bezecchi is allowed to overtake peko and uh john zarko is allowed to overtake um Jorge martin you know those things that maybe i don't know if any of us will come back anytime soon that those riders don't mess up the championship that both have 100 the free The freedom to go and um, all the other Ducati riders have the freedom to go and because at the end of the day Ducati shouldn't care because at the end of the day a Ducati rider will win the championship so I really hope we will get like a fair battle between those two and um, I think that Ducati is mature enough to do this I really hope I mean I understand that they probably did it last year with uh, with Enea because it was Yamaha versus Ducati. But this year it's Ducati versus Ducati, so just go for it. Yeah, and, you know, I, I get it's not the exact comparison, but it's the nearest comparison I can think of. It's like the 2009 World Championship with Rossi and Lorenzo at Yamaha. You know, Yamaha very well could have at that time 
told not that they would have listened but they could have told one of the writers you know to let the other one pass but they let them duke it out all over the season and it's the reason 2009 is one of the best seasons we've ever had it's why Catalonia in my opinion is top three greatest races ever because you let the best in the world do what they do because they've earned the right to be on that platform to fight it out and look I and I, I'm maybe being a bit optimistic here, but I'm giving Ducati the benefit of the doubt in that they won't do that because they are racing people at the end of the day. And they will recognize that Jorge Martin on a Pramac bike has earned the right to fight it out for that championship. And listen, if Paco's good enough, he'll win it. You know, last year he was good enough and he won it. And Yamaha, uh, sorry, not Yamaha, Ducati won't want to undermine their champion by telling Martin not to do anything. They want a legitimate champion because they know it undermines the sport if you basically have a puppet figure holding the title. It doesn't mean anything. So I think we'll get a very good championship battle. We'll get them fighting it out until the end. And listen, Another point that I want to mention, uh, because it actually pertains to marketing as well, you know, Maddie Patterson would love this if she was on, you know, Daniel Ross Amando, the guy in charge of, um, you know, the media side of things of MotoGP now, he's not going to want a puppet champion because that makes the sport look like a laughing stock. They are not going to go to Ducati. Ducati's not going to go to the riders and say, listen, if so-and-so overtakes, block him, or don't let him get past or anything like that, they will let them fight it out because there's too much at stake, I think, at the top of this. So that's just my thoughts on it. Yeah. Again, to uh, wrap this uh, thing up, I'm not worried about Jorge Martin uh, getting team orders from Ducati. <laughs> I'm worried about uh, Joan Zarcos, uh, Luca Marini, Marco Zecchi. That's actually, I'll make one more point about this before we move on, because that is a very good point. I think with most of these riders, um, I actually don't think there's going to be any uh, impetus for them to listen to Ducati, and this is why. Zarco's on his way out anyway, so he's not going to take team orders. You know, Marini, yeah, Zarco's just going to be given the massive fuck you to, to, to Ducati on his way out. You know, Marini and Bezzecchi are protected by Valentino, so they're not going to really do it either, are they? Um, and then as it, as it pertains to the likes of um, Bastianini, Bastianini might not even be a factor, to be honest, because he's so he's still dealing with the injury so much that he might not have any influence on it anyway. So listen, we don't know what's going to happen. This is purely speculation at this point, but I'm trusting that come the final day, we will have the battle that we deserve at the end. Yes, hopefully. And uh, I would like to talk to you about Franco Morbidelli. Yes. Like, let's switch gears because Frankie technically took a shit today. I mean, he gambled and it didn't play out. He was dead last and then retired, I believe. Mm -hmm. But I love the fact that he did what he did because nobody knows what the weather is going to do. Frankie yeah. has nothing to lose and everything to gain. Imagine you are in a, in a situation like Silverstone where it starts to rain and then it stops again. And then you are on slick tires and towards the end, you uh, may have an edge about above everybody. And imagine Frankie, let's say he wins that race or he is uh, on the podium whatsoever because his gamble plays out. Like at the moment, nobody cares if Frankie retires or if he finished in 15th or if he finished in 10th. I mean, nobody cares. He has a seat for next season. He has everything uh, with Yamaha that basically... He needs he needs mm -hmm. a seat right now. They won't fire him for bad results or whatsoever. So he's <laughs> very secure. And I love the fact that he took the gamble. Same with Fabio. And um, even though it didn't play out, when I'm watching those races, I want to see gambles like this. I'm surprised nobody in, on the back of the grid gambled to go directly into the pits and swap bikes before the race even started, like after the warm-up lap. Because if I'm somebody like Takanakagami, for example, what do I have to lose? It's my home GP. I can go into the pits, get the um, wet tires on and maybe get a podium or like a top five or even win a race at home. How awesome would that be? And mm -hmm. those riders who are secure for next year, who don't have to prove anything, I would love to see gambles like Frankie. And I just 
admire Frankie for doing it. I admire him for sticking to it and admitting, okay, it was wrong, but still he did it because he has the balls to do it. And uh, I'm very, very pleased by writers like him and Fabio. And I would like to see more of it. Like, why didn't in uh, in Silverstone... No, in Silverstone they did it. Yes, I love this as well. As well. When uh, those riders were coming in for wet ties. Yes, it didn't work out. But at the end of the day, who cares? Nobody gives a shit at the moment if, uh, let's say, if Frank and Morbidelli, to stick with him, finished uh, 10th or... 17th in Silverstone. Nobody cares about it. But the upside is so huge that I really like to see those gambles. I would love to see more of it because it adds a little level of excitement. Like, what if it stopped raining? You know, you always have to think about it. And yeah, uh, yeah that's what that was one entertaining factor today that I really appreciated from the race. Like, not only Frankie, but he's a good example for it because he stuck to it towards the end. Also, Michele Piro, he has nothing to lose. Just stick with the sta- slicks and go for it. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I'll just add a bit of context before I get into this. If you didn't see the race, ladies and gentlemen, uh, towards the end of the first lap, um, it basically started to drizzle quite heavily onto the track. And about 90% of the grid pitted to put on the, to get onto the bike with the wet tires. And then Michele Piro and all three Yamahas, including Cal Crutchlow, who was wildcarding, though that group of four stayed out on the track on their slicks instead of pitting with everybody else. And I love that they did it. I I actually couldn't agree with you anymore in this. I love that they took a chance and yeah, it didn't work, but who cares that it didn't work? They had the balls to make a decision. And listen, if that works out, you're the next Brad Bender. You know, you had the guts to make a decision. You rocked with it and you're a legend for staying out in slicks if the rain goes away. And that's the thing with weather. You know, I can't even believe we're talking about weather now, but this is the thing with weather. You don't know what the weather's going to do. In an alternate universe, that rain stops, the sun starts shining, and you're the best four bikes in the grid because you've got the right tires on. Yeah, today it didn't work out. Yeah, it started pissing from the heavens with a thunderstorm, but you took a chance. You took a chance. It didn't work, and nobody thinks any less of you for it. You know, I respect the hell out of them for doing it, and at one point they led by nine seconds. So, look, at the end of the day, it shows the character of the riders. They took a chance and in another on another day in another world that pays off massively for them the other riders on the wet tires run out of rubber they all crash and you lot end up winning so i respect a ton that they did it and i think it shows the personality that they stuck with that decision because not many riders would have done that but they did and i respect them for it you talked about f1 and the team orders and that that's like the bad thing about f1 but the good Mm. thing is that you have those alternative strategies for example that somebody pits and makes a wild decision and at some point it uh, works out and in motorcycle racing we usually don't get it because it's motorcycle racing we don't have pit stops here but Mm -hmm. when we get the chance then it's really nice also like when the flag to flag when do you pit when don't you pit like rossi and uh, lorenzo in misano 2015 Mm. those mind games also it's so incredible and i would like to see like raul fernandez for example Go in after the warm-up lap, swap to wet tires, and what if you win? You know, what if you win? Imagine Michele Piro won today. He would have been the hero for the next 10 years, and everybody would remember Michele Piro like we remember Danilo Petrucci beating Marc Marquez and um, Andrea Dovizioso in Mugello in 2019. Yeah, that's right. This is where legends are made. Nobody cares if you uh, made the wrong decision, especially like on a test ride role or Raul Fernandez role or... Let's say a Stefan Brade role. Those, who cares? I mean, Frankie Morbidelli role. Nobody cares that Frankie had a bad race today at the end of the day. But we care about them if it works out and we appreciate them if it works out. Like Brad Binder could have crashed in, uh, in Austria two years ago, but he didn't. And he's still remembered for exactly this moment. And I really, really love this about MotoGP when we have those flag to flag races that you can be such a hero even though you have no business of winning a gp for example so i gotta give a shout out to everybody who stayed out of sticks and at least tried it and i would love to see more of it because it's just entertainment 
Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And that's the one thing I love as well about flag to flag races, because it adds an extra element of psychology to the race. You know, like, let's say, let's just play, let's play fantasy here for a minute. And let's take Pego Banyai and Jorge Martin, for example. Say the rain isn't as severe today and we get a full race. If you're Pego Banyai and you see Jorge Martin petting to put wet tires on, that immediately makes you think, well, shit, do I pit? Do I go put tires on or do I stick out and do I back myself? And that's why I love flag to flag races because they add this dynamic of uncertainty to the race and they add this dynamic of backing yourself and not going with the grain and going against the grain. And it's why, like you said, it's why we love Brad Bender from two years ago. Chad Bender stayed out on slicks in the rain and ended up taking a massive punt, one in a million, and it paid off. I'd love to see more riders do that now. Admittedly, we don't get that many flag to flag races, so there aren't that many opportunities to do it. But when they do do it, the it it makes it so much more fun. It really does. Um, and I gotta say, like you said, to echo the sentiment, I have so much respect for Morbidelli, Quadraro, Piero, and Crutchlow for taking that chance because on another day, maybe it works. And now. Michele Piro can say, I led a MotoGP race with nine seconds, and he's speaking 100% uh, the truth. So he still won today. Is this frozen? Also, I would like to talk to you about Mark Marcus mm -hmm. because Mark did what Mark does. I mean, in flag, flag races or even in races like India where the conditions aren't perfect and like India for different reasons than Motegi now, but he just makes the most out of it every time. And he is so great in the wet. He's so great in those flag to flag situations. And I'm very interested in what do you think about honda at the moment because honda also Jean mir they had a good stretch of two races now like after the misano test honda was significantly better than they were before so what if honda just brought something to the bike which adds a little bit more performance to it maybe it doesn't solve all the problems maybe they don't have a ducati but at the end of the day what if honda is now competitive enough that to quote, um, I believe Gigi Dalinia said it, that um, Mark has to get out of his complicated contract or has to break his complicated contract to go to Rizimi. What if Honda is now good enough that they make him stay because they say, hey, you get the good bike you always wanted, you get the results. Now Joan Mir is also getting the results. So um, I'm interested to hear what you think about Honda and Joan Mir also, mm -hmm. and uh, especially like Mark Marcus. Yeah, this is a really interesting question because, like you said, in the last two races, which is, of course, India and now Japan, we've had two weekends now where we've seen the two Repsol Hondas actively be competitive again. And it's raised a lot of questions about what's causing this. Have Honda brought something new? Is it just the riders? And I'm on the side that it's more the riders making the difference rather than Honda. Um, the reason I think that is that I don't see much evidence that the bike is any different than it was before. I think what we're I think what we're seeing here is one in India we had we had a completely equal we had a complete equalizer in the new track and you saw two very very good riders make the difference. Don't forget Joan Mir is still a former world champion, very very good motorcycle racer. And Mark Marquez is just an alien who can make anything work. So in that race in India, you saw two really good riders make the difference. And then this weekend, um, Mutegi, which we haven't been back to in a while, I think, again, you saw two riders make the difference uh, again. Especially today, Mark Marquez is known for thriving in wet conditions. So... Where I kind of fall down on this is I don't think it's the fact that the bike's gotten any better. I think it's the fact that Mark Marquez can basically make the best or as near to the best out of anything. And I think Juan Mir is relatively similar in that he's a very hard worker who will try and get the most out of what he has. Now, you're, you, brought, you brought up something I was actually going to mention, which is Gigi Delinia's comments that Mark apparently does want to go to Grassini. 
I think that's still going to happen because I just don't think the bike has improved enough. I think he's riding it beyond the limit. Um, so I, I think we'll still see Mark go to Grassini because I don't think the bike's improved enough. I don't see any evidence that it has. For me, it's the riders that have made the difference this weekend, not the bike. What are your thoughts on it? Sorry, I can't hear you, Leo. Did you mute yourself? Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm, I muted myself nope. because... Uh... Peanut is sleeping here and uh, she's uh, sometimes like standing up and walking somewhere or just when she's dreaming, uh, scratching over the floor mm. and then you hear it uh, pretty loudly on the um, on the podcast. So I just muted myself and I forgot to unmute. So yeah, my thought about it is I can't believe Honda brought something to the test and didn't take anything away from it, you know? Mm. Like, Honda had a new bike on the um, at the test, and I talked a lot about it with Jekos. We know they didn't bring a new engine, you know, and they can't change the engine, but they brought a new aero package to Silverstone. Maybe they found a setup to make the aero package work more. Maybe they brought a new frame, or one of the frames they tested over the season given has given them something in comparison with maybe like a new swinger maybe they found something in the electronics department so i can't convince myself that honda took nothing away from the misano test especially with john mir and uh, with mark marcus being so competitive over the last two races and um, then i am asking myself like okay if honda is making any progress what does keep them from saying, okay, now you get the good bike, you're staying now. And there's one thing I heard, which is like an explanation why it took so long, that Mark wanted to talk with Honda in person and de um, announce his depart uh, departure in person. And Grisini has a lot of sponsors in Indonesia, so the whole thing will be announced in Indonesia. Whatever Gigi Dalinia says, I mean... I think if he speaks to the public about this, it's pretty certain. Yeah. But uh, at the end of the day, Honda could technically just say no and don't let him uh, breach the contract because who knows what's standing in this contract. And if Honda is improving, and let's remember, they didn't bring a new engine. Who knows if they get concessions or not, but if they bring a new engine, they could um, work on their rear grip problems a lot because it's coming from your engine all the time. And like 80% of your rear grip is coming from your engine, to quote uh, Simon Crafer. And he was told by an engineer. So a um, pretty good source there. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I can't think of Honda not making any improvements. I mean, I know Mark Marcus is riding beyond everybody else at the moment, but when you compare Misano, where he was like 23, 24 seconds uh, ahead of the next Honda, and then you compare India and you compare Motegi now, where Joan Mir was relatively competitive, then I'm starting to question if Honda really is still the same. You know, I don't know, but I, I'm i pretty sure, like my gut feeling says, Honda learned something at the Misano test. Honda brought something to India and uh, Motigi they didn't have before, e even if it's just an electronic setup or like a normal setup, you know. If it's just a new frame or a new swing arm or whatever, you know, maybe they found something along the line to give them hope. And uh, therefore, I think that Honda is indeed better now, not because of Mark Marcus. As you said, Mark Marcus is an alien. And especially like in races like India, where there's no data, and races like Mutigi, where it's reflective, like he's always been good there. I mean, I remember him. Uh, coming to the circuit of the Americas and smoking everybody in mm -hmm. 2013. But Joan Mir is not this type of rider. Joan Mir needs a little bit more of a competitive bike. And he was nowhere in Misano. He was nowhere even before this test. But now he kind of found something. And this makes me think that Honda is indeed better 
So I think there could be a possibility that Mark indeed stays. Well, th- that's a very interesting point because that then raises two more questions. If indeed Honda have found something, the first question is what have they found? Obviously, we don't know um, and probably won't know. Uh, and then the second question is if they have found something, which uh, you suggest they have. Is that enough to make Mark Marquez stay? Um, have they produced a trend on a graph that shows that they are back on the up and up again? Um, again, I have no idea. Um, if they have found something, that makes it very, very interesting because we thought this was dead, buried in the water, Mark's going to Ducati, blah, blah, blah. But maybe Mark has a much tougher decision to make now because if Honda have shown, listen, Mark, we found something in the electronics or we found something in this or that, then he might have a very tough decision to make because if they if they are making the bike competitive again and he can win another title with Honda again, then that's it for him. You know, that is that is the legacy right there. You know, Honda's man, Honda's rider. But what makes this even more interesting again is the Gigi Delinia comments and you know Gigi Delinia is a very wily old fox and he's been around MotoGP long enough to know not to make public statements unless there's something really heavy heading behind it so if he's come out and he said Mark Marquez wants to join Grassini then I believe Gigi because he's not reckless enough to make that kind of statement unless he knows there's something behind it so I mean, I think Indonesia just got a thousand times more interesting because we'll see what happens. Yeah. And also, I believe the Japanese people are very proud people. Very proud people. And if they have any kind of leverage on this contact, like what if Honda has to agree to let Marcus go and they say, simply okay no we have something you always wanted you wanted a competitive bike we've shown progress now you can't leave anymore i could totally see this happen because to quote gigi dalinia again it's a very difficult contract to break and the solution to everything probably is that i bought a honda now these couple of thousand euros directly went into the factory <laughs> they developed something which is incredibly working with this money and now they brought it to motegi and it's working so all we have to do is buy six more hondas and uh, marcus <laughs> is on the best bike again go fund me for hrc <laughs> <laughs> oh boy but yeah um on a serious note i would actually be not that honda will ever let me or anybody because i they obviously won't i would love to read their contract with mark marquez to see what those terms are because if somebody like Gigi delinia says that it's a very tough contract then you know it's a very tough contract and there's all sorts of things in there now for the last few years as you know as well as anybody there have been a lot of rumors that there's like a buyout clause that Marquez himself can activate to buy himself out of his contract with Honda, but that's got to be like, I mean, high high um eight figures because Honda will not let him go without a fight, and they won't let him go unless he absolutely diehard wants to go and can go. So I gotta I gotta say I'd love to I'd love to know what these terms are because they've got to be extreme. Yes, um, but I think this is enough for the whole Mark Marcus debate. <laughs> we are drifting again into speculation, which uh, I don't want to. But like our favorite topic usually are the stewards. <laughs> and the stewards have been quite uh, good over the last couple of races. Yeah. And um, I've read a tweet from Simon Patterson, and Simon was complaining about Marco Bezeki not getting a penalty for his first lap incident Mm -hmm. so um if you don't know is um the helicopter perspective uh, of this you can go to twitter and check out uh the the video simon posted or he reposted uh moto gp please do this now because i will elaborate on it for a second and uh, while i'm doing this uh, you can check the video because I think he is in a situation 
where he has nowhere to go. Either he crashes into uh, into Peko Banyai, who's somewhat coming from the outside, and he has to break harder. It's not his fault that John Zarko and um, Maverick Vinales went wide and Maverick crashed in the end. So I'm 100% agreeing with the stewards that this is a racing incident. There is nothing to punish here. And I would love to hear your thoughts about it because I don't want a world where we punish every little bit, mm. but like punish the severe ones. And I'm happy to point out that the stewards are doing a very good job over the last couple of weeks. And with this, I totally agree that they shouldn't have interfered and they didn't. So they made the right call. And as I think what Simon said there on Twitter is wrong, in my opinion. I think Marco Bezeki shouldn't get a penalty. And I don't think there should even be a discussion about him potentially getting a penalty. So I would love to hear what you think about it. Yeah, um, first of all, shout out to the MotoGP chimp stewards because they've been doing an amazing job for the last few weeks. Um, I hope they get very well. I hope they get very well rewarded for the luck that they've been given the paddock, and they've been doing a great job. So fair play to them. Um, here's where I stand on this. Um, and w- obviously, like you said, this is something we've talked about a lot, not just with the chimp stewards, but with uh, turn one incidents at the beginning of a race. I am I myself am very remiss to punish turn one incidents at the beginning of a race and here's why when you come to the opening turn or two turns of the opening lap of a race there's really not that much space with anybody it's kind of like a tin of sardines everybody's packed in at the beginning of the race and so you have to you have to give them some allowance for the turns they make and the break, the breaking that they undertake. And with Marco Bezzecki, I don't see any evidence that that incident to turn one was intentional or that he meant to do it. So I, I actually, for once, and I can't even believe I'm saying these words, I agree with the stewards. I think it was a racing incident. I actually agree with you. And I agree with it because, like I said, when it be- when it comes to turn one of the opening lap, you know, riders are trying more to get out of each other's way rather than trying to get into them. And Marco Bezzecki is not a dirty rider either. I've never seen a single incident where I can point to Marco Bezzecki being involved in an accident and say he meant that or he did that intentionally. So for me, I can't see enough reason to punish him for that, if I'm being honest. As far as I fall on it, it's mu- it's much closer to a racing incident than it is to a penalty. That's probably the best way I can put it. Totally agree, and I'm happy we don't uh, saw a penalty for Marco Bizzecki there. Um, I would love to hear your opinion about John Zarco and the whole restart. I know it's at the end of the day pointless, but mm. um, I would love to hear your opinion on it. What did you thought about him not being eligible to restart the race because he took this shortcut um, to to push his bike back into the garage in this five minute window? Um, yeah, this is this is another interesting discussion. Um, to be honest. I don't see the issue with it personally. I think that Joan Zarco and the stewards especially, they did a very safe job of getting the bike up, which was completely destroyed, by the way, in case you haven't seen this. You know, Zarco slid out onto the gravel, bike gets flipped, destroyed, boom, it's done. And they basically push it all the way back up um, into the pit lane entrance to get it back into the garage. I know it's not the most conventional way of doing it. I I certainly don't remember the last time I saw anybody do it, but it wasn't done in a dangerous way. There was nobody else coming in or going out. So, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I really don't think it was that deep. I don't think it was that big of an issue. And I certainly don't think it was punishable by not allowing him to restart the race. Um, I, I thought it was very severe and I thought it was very pedantic, if I'm honest. It's, it's not the decision I would have taken. I would like to answer this question with asking another question. Do you want a rider who is in the gravel after he crashed to go back on track and use the correct 
entry from the pits mm. do you think this is less dangerous do you think this is the right way to go because if you punish this behavior and somebody sees this or somebody knows this and especially in those conditions today mm -hmm. where anything could happen at any moment. Do you really want to have a rider not using the safety roads, which are built for those type of things, you mm -hmm. know, pushing a bike back or bringing a bike back and not going over a live track? Or do you want them to really spend more time than they need to in the gravel where anybody could crash at any second? Do you really want to have them using the correct um, way to the pit lane where again anything can happen especially in this um, conditions so I thought this is a very very stupid decision I mean at the end of the day it's pointless because the race didn't restart so who cares but like for future events I would love to get rid of this rule because it's just stupid I mean if this rule is indeed um, in the rule book the stewards didn't do anything wrong because the rule is there, but still the rule is stupid. So, yeah, I don't know. I would uh, have let him restart the race and also the explanation why Miguel Oliveira would be eligible because he retired earlier, but the bike wasn't in the garage. It was uh, before the garage. It's just stupid in my opinion. Just either you say nobody who crashed or retired, no matter what, can restart, or you say... If you were in the race and crashed like on the lap where the red flag was uh, was uh, given out, then you are eligible to restart. And if you do it like in a safe manner, like I believe Sean Zarko did, he did the right decision. The marshals made the right decision. Um, then everything should be fine. Yeah, it's it's one of those situations where you either allow both riders to restart or none of them to restart. You can't allow one to restart and one not to, because that just doesn't make any sense. As far as the Miguel Oliveira thing goes, um, again, I, I don't really get that either. I thought that was, again, pedantic and a bit weird by the stewards, but the stewards are weird, so you kind of just accept it at this point. But the Joan Zarco thing, I thought the stewards were very, very safe about it. They made sure there were no live bikes on track. Zarco made sure there were no live bikes on track. They did the right procedure and they got it back safely anyway. So what are we even arguing about? I, th I, th I thought it was the wrong decision. I thought it was stupid. I thought it was dumb and there was no need to do it. You know, There are times where you can use common sense with these things. And unfortunately on this one, the stewards just didn't use any. There's one thing I would like to point out mm -hmm. and I would like to give a shout out to Declan from Everything Motor Racing because he pointed out that the first 11 riders represented each of the 11 MotoGP teams that uh, are running. You, know, you have yeah. Ducati Factory Racing, you have uh, Pramac Racing, you have uh, Mooney VR46 and you have uh, Grisini. Mm -hmm. Then uh, you have Aprilia Factory Racing, you have Aprilia uh, Crypto Data RNF, mm -hmm. you have uh, Red Bull KTM Factory Racing, you have Gas Gas Factory uh, Racing, Tech 3, and uh, you have the Repsol Honda team, the Idemitsu uh, LCR Honda with uh, Takanakagami, and you have Fabio Cotavaro on the Monster Energy Yamaha. So the top 11 were racing for different teams and uh, were all teams that were are allowed to um to race in moto gp if you don't take Calcrutcho into consideration was running as a wildcard rider so mm -hmm. i thought this was a very uh, funny thing and uh, i would like to point this one out Yeah, it was actually really cool to see. Shout out Declan from Everything Moto Racing for pointing it out. I am amazed that the crypto data team has unfolded um, because I was certain <laughs> it was a scam. But shout out to them, you know, being one of the 11. It, it, it was cool to see, to be fair. Yeah, but still uh, the Kazakhstan bold <laughs> prediction was, uh, was true. So I'm happy with this one. Yeah. And moving on to Moto2. I thought Moto2 was hella boring. Hella boring. The only thing that really amazed me was uh, Zonta van den Goerberg. He was incredible again. He showed that India wasn't a fluke. He had a difficult qualifying, a difficult Saturday in general, going through Q1 and the free practice weren't as good as they uh, should be 
uh, for a writer of his standards and I think that he is doing a phenomenal job at the moment. Everything is clicking at the moment when we pointed it out after India. And it's very, very nice to see him repeating a top 10 and showing everybody he belongs there. He has one of the most difficult tasks in the whole MotoGP world where he's coming from the Junior GP Moto3 onto a Moto2 bike. And within two years, he's inside the top 10 now consistently and it's amazing to see he's doing a phenomenal job and i'm very very proud of what he achieved yeah delighted for zonta like you said proved that india wasn't a fluke it wasn't a freakish wild card incident um this proved his talent and proves why he deserves to be here so delighted for zonta glad he got another top 10 and that like a, it's actually like i was saying after the india episode this is such a great platform for him to build on for the rest of the season and next you know getting this top 10 momentum is so important and so valuable especially in a class as competitive as moto 2 is so shout out zonta for today man so happy for him so glad that he's this competitive and I can't wait to see what he does in 2024 as well, because if he can keep this going, he could be a real top five contender next year. Yeah, and he beat riders like Darren Bidner, Tony Abellino, Joe Roberts, Isan Guevara, his teammate Barry Baltus. I mean, it's very, very good to see him beating big names. I mean, he technically beat Alonso Lopez, but Alonso Lopez had two uh, long lap penalties, so I don't know. Alonso Lopez but, beat Alonso Lopez. <laughs> but yeah, that's the thing. At the end of the day, it's Alonso's fault that he got those two <laughs> long laps. So, um, I mean, it's very, very nice to see Zonta doing good stuff, and I'm very, very happy. And to come back to the whole Sean Dylan Kelly situation, him coming over from uh, the Moto America 600 uh, series, going into Moto 2, this is what happens when you give people enough time and not just kick them out for somebody who has more money than you and um, lose your dignity doing it. You know, if you commit to a rider, at least commit to his contract. You know, Zonta had a two year contract and. Uh, Sean Del Kelly had a contract for uh, this year and they still kicked him out. And I'm very, very convinced Zonta will race in Moto 2 again next year for the same team. There's no reason why he shouldn't. And um, on the same page, I think Sean Del Kelly will race in Moto 2. And I really like seeing riders giving the chance to develop because this sport is so fast paced where. If you are not the next Pedro Acosta, you might be out after half a season. Like, for example, look at Remy and KDM or, or <coughs> maybe Augusto Fernandez now. So there are so many factors. And I think it's a great thing that Zonta is providing the team with the results they deserve, he deserves. And also showing everybody, hey, just give me some time. I have talent and I can go all the way because... He is an amazing human being. Uh, I have nothing bad to say about him. He's so nice. And to see him getting the results after those difficult races like Silverstone, like Misano, like Austria, it's very, very nice that he now gets it consistently. And I hope it's not uh, just those two races. I hope this is now a consistent thing to see Zonta and the points and there will be ups, there will be downs, but at the end of the day, if the tra trajectory is going in this direction, we are having a very, very entertaining future with Zonda, and I'm very happy about it. On the flip side, Tony Abolino is doing everything he can to lose this championship. I mean, what, what do you even want to say, you know? He has a bad qualifying, he's... Uh, behind somebody like Darren Binder or Zonta, people he should technically beat if he aspires to win a championship. Pedro is riding home a very safe third place. There is no need for him to challenge Chantra and Ogura for the first two positions. And he's just doing everything right. And it seems like Tony Abolino is uh, doing everything wrong at the moment. Yeah, it's, all I'll say about this is, is it seems like 
Tony Arbolino's just lost his head completely and he's losing his composure, which is, as we know, the worst thing that you can do, especially when you're fighting for a championship. You know, the golden rule of fighting for a championship in Moto G- MotoGP Moto2, two-wheeled motorsport, the golden rule is you always keep your head, you know, because you never know when opportunities could come up to pick up points and to pick up wins and challenge people who are leading. You don't go and do what Tony Arbolino is doing. It just looks like his composure has completely gone, completely lost his head. And it's a shame because, you know, the title race between Acosta and Arbolino has been really tight this year. And like you said, I know we say it jokingly, but it does seem like he's doing everything he can to lose this championship. And it's not what you want to see a rider do because we want to see competitive run-ins and all this kind of thing. But it's another disappointing weekend for Tony Arbolino, and you can only hope that he regains his head for the next race. That's really all I can say. Yes, also very important news. Peanut just got up, walked Yay. through the room, looked at me, didn't want to cuddle, <laughs> and now she's in her box uh, sleeping again. So Shout she Peanut, is man. absolutely fried. <laughs> but um, regarding Tony... I mean, I don't know what is happening with him, but it looks like the flip side, what is happening with uh, Zonta. Because Zonta is riding his wave and he's confident. It There was this upward trajectory over the last couple of races, basically since the summer break, mm-hmm. and he's doing very, very well. But with Tony Abolino, it looks like it's the flip side. Like he lost his way a little bit and then uh, can't qualify. And then he's in a bad position in a race. And it's just like a downward spiral. I thought he fought himself out of this one with India, but apparently not. And uh, it's sad because somebody like Tony Abolino should compete for a championship. He should compete for a MotoGP seat. You know, we mm. were talking about him going going to Grisini. You know, yeah. And uh, all of this stuff is very, very sad because a you want races like Cota, mm-hmm. where Tony Abolino and uh, Pedro Alcosti are battling towards uh, till the end. You want to see a championship like we have in Moto3 or in MotoGP now where it's tight, like a Dennis Foggia, Pedro Acosta situation, like Remy and Raul. And like uh, also kind of Fabio and Peco last year, even though it was less entertaining because you got the feeling, okay, this downward trajectory for Fabio is really going downward and the mm. upward for Peco is really going upwards. But um, yeah, still, it's... A little bit sad that Tony kind of lost his way. Maybe it's still in his head that he missed out on a MotoGP seat. Maybe there's something within himself or the team or whatsoever. We don't know. We can just speculate. And I don't want to do this because at the end of the day, it's pointless. We don't know. But it's still sad that we don't see Tony Avellino getting regularly beaten by somebody like Jake Dixon, you know? Maybe I, I'm not quite sure how the championship standing is at the moment, but I will look it up. What if he loses the uh, second place to Jake Dixon because he's not doing well at the moment? Yeah, I mean, 60 points behind Jake Dixon now, but still um, uh, unlikely, but still possible. We still have six races to go. In six races, you can lose 60 points. Yeah, of course. But maybe it looks like a stretch that Jake Dixon finishes second. And uh, yeah, but with Tony, I don't know what to say. It's a little bit sad, and I expected more. Yeah, that that's pretty much all you can say. You know, you've got a rider like Zonta whose pro- whose trajectory looks like this started at the bottom and is going up, and then you have Tony who started so high and it's going down. Um, you know, maybe the MotoGP talk did it. You know, that could be a very valid factor, but he just hasn't recovered his head and his composure at all, and it seems like he's falling apart. A bit like Ayogora last season. Um, it seems like the title challenge is just wasting away, and that's a real shame. Um, hopefully he gets it back together. You know, for the last six races, hopefully he does. But at the moment, I can't see it happening. 
regarding the whole MotoGP talk. During the broadcast today, they were talking about Pedro Costa still not having a MotoGP seat, that it may be annoying him and uh, there may be a possibility that he doesn't even get a MotoGP seat at all. I saw this. Which is very, very strange when you consider Ayo uh, Sanchez, you know, Vietti and Dennis Enchu already. Yeah. So they must be sure. And also with KTM, I don't know what the point is here because whoever you have, take Brad Binder out for a second, those three riders, Pedro is better than all of them instantly. Agreed. And after like a season, he's probably better than Brad Binder. If you give this man a bike he can win on, then he will win. So if I was KTM, I would do everything in my power to get him on the factory bike as soon as possible which would be next year mm -hmm. i would have let him test the ktm in misano already i would uh give him all the affirmation i can possibly can to say hey you are the guy for our future you are the man we want in our factory team you want you are the man we want to be the face of our franchise But apparently KTM is doing everything they can to please somebody like Paul Espargaro or Augusto Fernandes or even somebody like Jack Miller and neglect Pedro in a way. And this got me thinking, like, what if KTM burns a bridge there and doesn't give him a MotoGP seat for 2024 and loses him to somebody else? Because if I was Pedro, I would be fed up. It's it's certainly a, a very strange scenario that's unfolding. Um, I do have to say it is very weird. I saw quotes that I think Crash Moto GP reported on I think Thursday or Friday, and Pedro said that he might have to spend another season in Moto Two. But like you said, they've already signed up Celestino Vietti and Dennis Anchu, so it's not going to be with Io. Um, It's, it's a really interesting question, and I've actually been thinking about this, and I actually want to hear your thoughts about this, because this is my theory. What if KTM have burned their bridges with Pedro, Mark Marquez goes to Grassini, and Acosta goes to HRC? I mean... I don't know if I would do this if I was Pedro. But would Pedro I don't know do if it? I would... If I would trust somebody uh, like Honda to give him a bike. Let's not uh, be kidding ourselves. I mean, he is still a rookie. is a lot to learn. And the KTM is a better bike to learn on, especially like with the new carbon uh, chassis mm. than uh, a Honda is. So I've heard rumors about him. I mean, not him. Um, about Vinales going to Honda if indeed Mark is leaving. Weird. And this would leave a Aprilia factory seat open and I would see Pedro more or less there more than I would see him at Honda. But I still think he is uh, he's contracted to KTM and I think he will race for KTM. I don't think he will race in Moto2. I think there will be a solution where he has a MotoGP seat next year because I don't think KTM can afford to lose him. No, I agree. But still, it's a very strange... But You know, everybody who has ever been in uh, negotiations with their employee knows that um, validation and um, appreciation is a very big part of a work relationship because... For example, when I'm working at a company and I get a certain salary, the salary isn't necessarily what I need to survive because this is much lower than I would probably want because I want a salary which shows me, hey, you're appreciating me, you want me, you keep me, um, you value me, you know? Yeah. Like, I know this from a, a time where I was making my bachelor's degree. I could easily live on a thousand euros uh, a month with rent with internet with everything you know mm -hmm. thousand it's not too much you can't really um you can't really afford too much there especially like with the rent prices here but that's a different topic but 
that doesn't mean because I can survive on this, I want this salary, like where I have a thousand euros left uh, to spend in a month. I want something which shows me, hey, you appreciate it. We want you there. And this is also something I see with MotoGP riders like Jorge Martin and his whole factory thing. He wants to be appreciated by Ducati and he wants that a manufacturer views him as the number one guy, not necessarily the money or whatever. It's like the validation. And I think um, KTM is missing out on building a relationship with Pedro, which could last over 10, 15 years, like Honda did with Mark, you know, Honda and like Repsol, they always supported him. They always gave him everything he needed and he's staying with them up until maybe the end of the season. So, mm -hmm. All you want is give a rider the validation he needs that he is your guy. And I don't know what's taking KTM so long. It's so strange. I still think K uh, KTM will put Pedro on a factory bike next year. But I still don't know what the point is of uh, waiting so long and having this uncertainty here. The only guess that I can make, and again, this is a very uneducated guess, but this, this is where my head's at with it. The only thing I can think of is that the upper echelons, the higher management, like the pit buyers and so on of KTM, don't want to distract Pedro from chasing the Moto2 title. Um, so maybe they're putting all this stuff in the back burner until he's won the title and then you'll see it. That's just a guess. But I, I, I do think you've made a very interesting point there. When Mark Marquez was in Moto2, You always saw Repsol and HRC supporting him and basically making it so, so clear that we want you here. You are the diamond in the crown of the future. You are going to be in the factory team and you're going to lead the charge. And we've never really seen that with Pedro Acosta. We've never seen that kind of relationship. And it is, it's almost a very distant dynamic between KTM and Pedro. It, it feels more like a marriage of convenience than a marriage of love which is what Mark had with Honda when he was in Moto2, for example. And it, it is it is a weird thing when you think about it. Um, but like I said, I have no inside information on this. I have no idea what the reason is for the delay for the holdup. But I, I mean, my other guess is that they're trying to find somewhere for one of the other riders to go. Maybe Jack Miller goes to Honda. I don't know. So then Pedro slides into the factory seat. But really, it's all pie in the sky at the moment because we don't have any idea, really. Yeah, we can only speculate. And like you said, there's no real point in speculation because it gets us nowhere. One thing I would like to uh, mention, you are on track to have the championship in Moto3 nailed down by one year delayed. You picked Jaume Masia last year to win the championship. He obviously didn't. Mm -hmm. But it looks like this year might be his year. And unfortunately, you didn't pick him this year. You picked Dennis Ernschu, who kind of <laughs> fucked it up the over Turkish the last... Turkish terrorist, uh, come on. <laughs> I mean, it's funny. Basically, since he said uh, Danny Olgado isn't a championship contender <laughs> because he's fucked in the head, he he's doing everything to throw the championship away. <laughs> and it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> Um, I mean, India was a catastrophe for him, and uh, now Motegi is a catastrophe for him. So it's a strange one with Dennis, but Dennis is Dennis. He is the menace, and I would love to see him in Moto2 mm. because I think this bike suits him much better. Yeah. But, I mean, we are looking at a championship fight between Daniel Gardu, who's a very, very talented rider, And two very experienced riders of Jaume Masia on a Honda and um, Ayumu Sasaki on a KTM. Sasaki didn't win any races this season. Mm -hmm. So we could be looking at a champion without winning a race, which would be <laughs> hilarious. So, um, yeah, it's very, very strange that we now have those three guys uh being basically equal on points in Moto3 and in Moto3 everything can happen it's so crazy like Ayuma Sasaki was kind of a favorite before the season and Jaume Masia was always this talented rider who couldn't get it together then he had this weird stretch um, where he had the technical uh, technical 
I want to say knockout, was it? Defect. Oh, the DNF. Yeah, yeah, where the technical issue, that's what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. and couldn't finish the race. Technical knockout. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm thinking about technical knockout. By the way, I didn't watch the recent UFC, so please no spoilers. Bro, did you see the PFL last night? Man like no. Cedric Dumbay. Oh, no. go and watch it. Go and watch it. I don't know if it's on the zone. I will watch it if it's on the zone, because I have a lot of time to spend next week, probably. Seven second my... knockout. Nice. I bought my, <laughs> yeah, the seven seconds I can afford to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, regarding <laughs> Moto3, um, Roman Masia was always this kind of guy like Maverick who couldn't get it together. Now he's on his way and it just feels like he will fuck it up. And uh, with Danny Argado, he kind of pulled himself out of the mud and he was like on a very bad stretch not very bad stretch but for his standards not as good as he was in the beginning of the season Ayumu Sasaki uh, kind of is back so it's a very very uh, interesting and um, exciting championship because in Moto3 anything can happen especially like going to a track like Phillip Island where you know it's going to be a slipstream battle so it's going to be crazy and I'm all here for it yeah um, yeah, it's been really, really great. And Moto3 was a very good race. Um, yeah, with Shami Masia, it's really weird because, like you said, I predicted him to win the whole thing last year and then he kind of just fell apart and threw it all away. And this year, he has had that Maverick Vinales mixture of form where he's been nowhere and then he's right back in it, which is very weird. Ayumu Sasaki was very, very good. Um, he did his thing as always. He's kind of always there or thereabouts. But. Yeah, it's it's a it's a, it is like a triple threat match at this point where you have Danny Holgado, Ayumu Sasaki, and Dennis Anchu, and they're all kind of just it's it's kind of like a Mexican standoff where they're all facing each other down. They're all level on points, and Phillip Island's going to be a hell of a lot of fun. I'll tell you that. Yes, I mean Mandalika uh, last year was crazy in the sense that I believe Dennis Foggia just took off. Yeah. And maybe Leopard has something in their back pocket now. But uh, races like Valencia, races like uh, Phillip Island or even Malaysia, it's so chaotic and it's so Thailand with those long straights. It's so chaotic. And we still go to Qatar. And Qatar always has been a very strange place with a Moto3 race because of the long straight and it's so tight. And I'm very, very excited for it. And uh, I can't wait for the championship to play out. So what do you think? Who will win? What, in Moto3? Yes. <sighs> Moto3, I think that... I think Jaume Massey is just about going to do it this time. Um, like I said, I, I think with Moto3, it really comes down to who's on their individual run of form rather than who's great over the season. And I think with Ayumu, or sorry, not Ayumu, with um, Jaume Massey, he's hitting his very good streak of form at just about the right time. And I think he's gonna just pip Ayumu Sasaki and Danny Holgado to the title this year but I am gonna say it's it's really interesting having races like Qatar this late in the year as opposed to being so early in the year because that's gonna be another dynamic change for Moto3 like you said Moto3 is usually chaotic in Qatar so that's gonna be a big factor too in who's able to handle those conditions well yeah I mean I thought Rame Masia did a brilliant job today mm-hmm I think uh, everything he did was uh, amazing. He had the right timing on when to push. He had the right uh, positioning in this group. And I kind of get the feeling Ayuma Sasaki is providing the better package at the moment. I don't necessarily trust Daniel Gado and Tech 3 to put it together over those long overseas races. So I think it's between Masia and uh, Sasaki. But I still uh, believe that Ayumu Sasaki will win it. It would be so funny if Dennis Anshu came from out of nowhere and won. That would or be David Alonso. Or David Alonso, yeah. I mean, kind of like the RKO out of nowhere, just Dennis Anshu out of nowhere. It would be it would be just amazing. But 
yeah, the thing people have to appreciate is, you know, there are still six races to go, and some of the tracks we have to go to are going to be real X-Factor tracks that will change up the dynamic a lot, so nothing's set in stone yet, you know, these titles are still up for grabs, and people... People in all classes, with the exception of probably Moto2, you know, in MotoGP and Moto3, riders should be focused on picking up the most points they can because there is still a lot to play for. Yes. So uh, I guess we will see each other in two weeks. Uh, we didn't have any technical malfunctions with the platform today, so hooray. Um, yeah, I'm not looking forward to uh, waking up. <sighs> waking up so early again <laughs> but uh, you gotta do what you gotta do and i really appreciate those american rounds where you can watch the races in the evening oh really yeah like it. but um yeah i'm very happy uh, with the way it played out today uh, we had some exciting races and we had moto 2 so uh i'm happy to talk to you again in two weeks after Mandalika, and it's going to be a very exciting stretch. It feels like we are this close towards the end, but it's still six races to go. So you can yeah, feel I'm it very, building. Very, it's coming. It's yeah. coming. I'm very excited. So thank you very much for joining me, Keelan. Thank you everybody for listening, and goodbye. See you each other after Indonesia. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>